everyone, and welcome to our session today on social inclusion. We're so excited that you were able to join us today on our last session of our free conference on how do we make Canada more age inclusive. We invite you to open up the chat box and you can see folks here already. Please let us know who you are. Maybe you have an organization you're representing and where in the, where in the world you have located your work today. So for instance, I am usually in Toronto, but I am currently in Sandy Cove, Nova Scotia. Let us know who you are, what you're doing, and let's share some great resources in our chat box today. We are also very grateful to our sponsors. As you know, we've been able to make this conference free to participants. Our friends and co-presenters at Help Age Canada, the Canadian Frailty Network, AgeWell, Healthy Aging by the United Way, and IROC, the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you as well to our co-hosts. We're delighted that Help Age Canada, the International Federation on Aging, Toronto Public Library, the Canadian Frailty Network, the National Institute for Care of the Elderly, the National Initiative for Care of the Elderly, Healthy Aging by the United Way, IROC, AgeWell, the Canadian Center for Elder Law, the International Longevity Center of Canada, and the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse are all co-hosts for this great work. And it takes a village and we're so grateful to them as leaders in making Canada more age inclusive. Couple little housekeeping details. Don't worry what's going on behind you. Your microphones and your videos will be turned off during the webinar. So you can give a sigh of relief. If your kids go running behind you, you'll be fine. If you want to adjust the video size of your speakers, of the people who are, are talking to you, you can drag the line between the video frame and the slides. Just drag it and you can adjust that and you can uh, change some of the viewing that you have. Again, it depends a little bit if you're on a computer or a tablet. We are recording. Our webinars are recorded and posted on our CanH's website. We are also broadcasting live on Facebook and through YouTube. And we invite our colleagues and friends who are joining us live on these platforms that you can engage in our comment section. We have team members from CanH who are there to moderate and capture your questions and thoughts. Couple quick issues for IT. So you can type your questions that you have for our expert panelists in our question and answer box. Have a look at the screen in front of you and you should see a bar with different icons. One of the icons says Q&A and has a little double bubble, a little speech bubble there. If you click on that, you can type at any point your question that you have. And we're gonna have a moderated discussion at the end where we call into your questions. If you're in our chat, and I hope you are, let's stay active and engaged. You may need to use the drop down arrows to go to where it says panelists and attendees. Make sure that you don't just write the panelists, but you click on a panelist and attendees so that you can share your thoughts everywhere. Great to see people coast to coast to coast in our chat already sharing information. It's critically important that we know what we did right and what we can improve on. You will get an incredibly short little evaluation at the end of this, a couple of seconds of your time. And I'm going to really beg you to take that time and make sure that you give us the feedback that you can. A lot of our work is on social media. And here are some of the hashtags that we're using. They'll be copied into our chat box too. So if you are live right now and you want to share some of this information, we've got CanAge Seniors and CanAge Voices. Seniors, age inclusive, age inclusion, social isolation, ageism, and intergenerationalism are the uh, social media hashtags that we are using. Again, you'll find them in our chat box. So I'm so delighted to welcome you to this session today on social inclusion. I'm going to take a couple of minutes to introduce our Voices of Canada's Seniors, a roadmap to an age-inclusive Canada. Then I'm going to just have an opportunity to share with you a couple of quick highlights from the wonderful biographies of each of our expert panelists today. Then I'm going to invite them one by one to take the stage and share with us about five to seven minutes or so their ideas about what we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive. At the end of that, I will invite 
all of our expert panelists to join us and take the stage together. And that's where we get to you and your questions. We're gonna have one of our co-host policy officers pop on screen and they're gonna ask the questions that you've put in the chat box and we'll be able to give those to the panelists. We're gonna then finish off with a couple of quick extra resources that you might want and some ways to stay in touch and move forward together. You know, Canada was unfortunately somewhat unique in not having a real plan for our aging population. We didn't have a one resource that you could go to that wasn't kind of partisan or from a medical model in order to how to deal and how to think through how we need to move forward with our aging population in Canada. So CanAge picked up the pen and we consulted coast to coast to coast. We consulted with the guy around the corner, the local seniors group, the Archbishop of the Anglican Church of Canada, experts in the fields of law, sociology, social work, health, epidemiology, public health, urban planning, and more. We then folded in all of the previous commissions and inquiries, reports that we have had in Canada about aging or the issues associated with. And we did a deep dive and putting it all together, we created one document, a really, really easy to navigate plan. And we invite you to have a look at our six compass points that we've been exploring over the course of this free conference, violence and abuse prevention, optimal health and wellness, infection prevention and disaster response, caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing resources, economic security, which we just concluded, and now here we are talking about social inclusion. Our roadmap, which you can download at canage.ca slash voices or go online on the same website. You can download it as a PDF, get the whole report, or you can see the report in a dynamic way by just going to canage.ca slash voices and clicking on one of these compass posts. You will open up to a letter and in that letter, you'll see issues. You can click on the issues and they will expand and you will see the key recommendations with a bit of a summary under each one. So our issues 35 through 40 on social inclusion have a number of key recommendations under them. My name is Laura Tamlin Watson. I'm the CEO of CanAge, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. Our role is to improve the lives of older people across Canada and bring the voice of Canada's seniors to the table. In no particular order, I'm going to introduce to you our expert panel today. First, I'd like to introduce to you a dear friend, Dr. Raza Mirza. He's a senior research associate at the Institute for Life Course and Aging. He also runs the National Initiative for Care of the Elderly. Raza has been teaching as well at the University of Toronto and Ryerson University. He's got a PhD from the University of Toronto Faculty of Pharmacy, and perhaps we have never needed people with that degree of expertise as much as we do right now. Also excited to introduce to you, Emily jones Jonas. She's the CEO and co-founder of Connected Canadians. And Emily comes from a background of business and computer science. And she has been moved to bring forward the question of digital literacy and how we work to improve digital literacy across the Connected Canadians team. And so she's gonna speak a little bit about that great work that she's doing. Another dear friend, Dr. Kahir Laji, he's the executive director at the United Way Southern Interior. He also wears a second hat as provincial director of population health at the United Way of the Lower Mainland. And you know, Kahir has been really working so hard and the emergency responses with COVID-19, but that is just more recently what he does. He is a gerontologist. He has been working extensively in community development. He works locally as well as nationally and indeed internationally. He has a deep understanding of the role that community plays and also how organizations can support communities in becoming more age inclusive. We're delighted also to have Alex Carruthers at the Toronto Public Library Manager of Learning and Community Engagement. And her work has focused on digital literacy, 
workforce development and community outreach. She is a digital public spaces librarian before her work at TPL at Edmonton Public Library. And we know how critically important it is to have digital literacy and to have public spaces. And whether those spaces are gonna be in person and or online, those are issues that COVID-19 have really brought up and we're excited to have Alex at this conversation. A dear friend, Gregor Stenen is the executive director of Help Age Canada, and Gregor has been working around the clock as well to make sure that we have been able to meet the needs of older people and their supporters, as well as communities, particularly in this time of COVID-19. You know, Gregor has dedicated his life to serving marginalized and underprivileged populations. He, again, works locally, he works nationally and internationally, and has been a new voice as well in the field of aging, calling for the increased rights of older people. And one of the things I'm also going to help uh, bring forward is some of his work about how he has set up some small micro grants to help communities who are in crisis during the time of COVID-19. It's been really inspiring work. We are also taking a quick moment, and, and Alex, this is a special shout out to the work that Toronto Public Library is doing. We know as the largest public library system in North America that the Toronto Public Library doesn't just serve its own community, but is actually a beacon for leadership and innovation around the world. And Toronto Public Library and CanAge announced its partnership on National Seniors Day. It is also October, which is Library Month. And so we invite you to learn more about the partnership of the Toronto Public Library and CanAge on our websites. You will see the press releases there, but a special warm welcome to our friends and new partners at the Toronto Public Library. So we're asking the question today, how can we make Canada more age inclusive? And the word inclusive we're going to use a couple times because we're talking about social inclusion. And I am now going to invite to the stage, my dear friend Gregor Snedden. And you know, Gregor has been working to promote age inclusion, but also social and community inclusion, both at a macro scale as well as a micro scale. So I'm going to kick it off to you first, Gregor. What do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive? Thanks, Laura. A real, a real privilege to be here with such a fantastic panel and, and a real privilege to, uh, to, to speak to you first. You know, I. Uh, as a, as a good ENFP, I kind of start from a, a wide angle to, to, uh, to look at the specifics. And so I wanted to say a few words, a little bit about uh, social inclusion and, and narrow down on a few uh, uh, practical things that we, that we all can do. Well, you know, social isolation itself is, is something that's objective. It's a, it's a quantity of social relationships and, and, con and contacts. Loneliness, however, is a subjective experience and it's very related to perception around the quality and quantity of those relationships. It's very personal and really depends on the values and needs and wishes and feelings of, of every individual. But critical and, and so important, just taking a big step back, is the word relationship. And I would argue that, you know, relationship is fundamental to being, period. What I am is my relationships. And relationship is primal. It's the glue. It's the foundation of life. I mean, imagine if you did not have a single relationship of any kind. Well, you, you can't, there, there's really no such thing. And yet we allow older people to recede in many cases to an almost relationshipless state or one that depends on unhealthy or one way relationships. I remember working with an older uh, person once a long time ago who had a very unhealthy relationship they were involved in. It was one of abuse. This person suffered from mental illness. And I challenged him and why he was continuing in this relationship. And he pulled out his little flip phone and he said, because it's the only person in the world that knows this number and calls me. It's the, the only time I ever hear my name. You know, social isolation is a deprivation of, of social connectedness and an understanding of 
of our own place and who we are. Mother Teresa says the, the true poverty is to be unloved or unwanted. And it's critical for survival. I mean, it even shows in extreme examples how, how infants who lack human contact fail to thrive and even die. Social isolation is, is considered the worst punishment when you think of solitary confinement in some prison systems. Well, if you can imagine, 2016, 17% of the Canadian population was age 65 and over. And this is expected to increase by almost a quarter, 24, 25% of our entire Canadian population in 15 years. And the effects of social isolation and loneliness are huge. And we could talk all about all of the health impacts, even mortality that are related to social isolation and loneliness. But I'd like to focus on a couple of key areas that I think as Canadians, we can address for a future of a, of a age inclusive Canada. The first issue, issue 38 in the Voices platform roadmap is, is ageism. And ageism is the stereotyping, prejudice and discrimination against people on the basis of their age. It means treating people unfairly because of their age. And people make assumptions about older people and older age that really do not reflect reality. Some of these assumptions include that all older people are frail, dependent, or experiencing mental and physical decline. And this results in prejudice, discrimination, and means that individual experiences of ageism are being ignored. And I would suggest, number one, we need to start within ourselves and our own assumptions and behaviors and our language around aging. I myself make assumptions all the time. I, the way I think and refer to older people in certain ways, I can be, be guilty of making broad characterizations or simplifying the challenges and seeking single solutions for older people. What changes can I make? Maybe even making the choice not to use a certain word or term to becoming aware of ageism in my own community and my family. How do I speak and how do people in my community and family speak to older people or, or about older people? What language do I just assent to when I'm in those circles and let it go? What jokes, stories, harmless references? Can I become more aware of elder abuse and neglect and not look the other way? Three, and noted again in the Voices platform, recommend 127 to challenge ageism. Check out the challenge ageism toolkit on the Help Age website. In it, you'll find all kinds of resources and ideas from writing to your local MP or working with your faith community or local organization to raise awareness in your community. It's important for us to raise this awareness broadly within and within our communities so that we can have broader impacts. We can vote, we can say yes to changes in legislation, to how our taxes are being directed. But that change comes by building an awareness of the issues that we are facing as a whole community. A critical part of an aid inclusive Canada also is access, access and voice. Older people need to be full participants in the rapidly changing world. And to be full participants and decision makers in the policies and structures that will affect them. And a critical part of participation and voice is access to the medium of communication that we take for granted, technology. For many older people, technology and digital literacy is accessible and normative, but for many, many seniors, it is not. Technology can be intimidating and unintuitive and simply out of reach, either financially or physically or because of where one lives. I know others, Emily and Raz, will be speaking to digital literacy specifically, but I would add here again that as issue 36 in the Voices Roadmap highlights, digital literacy and the use of technology has never before been so critically important as it has been in COVID-19. Now, Help Age Canada, with our help from our friends at uh, Connected Canadians has launched a, a national tablet and digital literacy uh, program called Seniors Can Connect as an offering to assist older people for whom technology would be otherwise inaccessible. One-on-one -on -one personalized support through technology mentors provides a confidence building experience and we're, and we're very pleased and excited to be unrolling this right now. 
recommendation 119, you know, we need to support and encourage older people who are not engaged with technology to do, to do so, to take a little time, support programs like Seniors Can Connect or other programs in your community, volunteer in one of these programs or at your local library or community space. And recommendation 120, a key challenge, however, is the extraordinary cost of data, especially in rural and remote areas. Lobby the government for subsidized internet access and data for seniors and low-income people in Canada. Technology is no longer just a luxury. It's a necessity for full participation, a safety line, and the number one way to keep our seniors and communities connected through COVID-19 and beyond. So let's again, focus on relationships and uh, address ageism within, within our families, within our local communities and work towards for our seniors providing access and voice so that our communities can stay connected and we can, we can all work uh, together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gregor. The work that you're doing at Help Age Canada makes a huge difference and I'm excited to dig into some of that work as well. All right, thank you. We'll let you off the stage and I'll welcome again another dear friend, Kahir Laji. Kahir has been working at the United Way for some time and making real change across this country, another key leader in the way. Kahir, I'll get you to turn your video on and join us on the stage. And so one of the things that we're asking is, you know, organizations like the United Way, it's a federated model. You've had a big chunk of money from the federal government, but we know that we need to do lots, lots more. So I wanna ask you, you know, from the United Way's perspective, from your perspective, what do we need to do that can help make Canada more age inclusive and maybe share some of the experiences that have been really positive over the course of this time too. So I'm gonna step off the stage and turn it over to you, asking you the question. What do you need to do to make Canada more age inclusive from your point of view? Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And, and congratulations to you and, and, and the CanAge team for a successful round of Voices uh, interactive sessions over the course of the last few days. You know, I'd start off by echoing uh, how Gregor um, uh, opened his, his, his remarks in that we've learned very quickly that there's a difference between social isolation uh, and loneliness. Uh, and that, you know, people can be isolated uh, physically, but not feel lonely. And there are those that can be surrounded by people either in a room or in a virtual room like Zoom and still feel lonely. And to honor that personal perceived experience, I think uh, is a really important uh, note to make. You know, at United Way, th there's three pillars to, to the work that we do. It's keeping older Canadians active active in mind and body and spirit, connected through curating and, and facilitating what we call vital connections in a way that is intergenerational in nature, in a way that is socially and culturally sensitive to each person's background and collective life experiences. And engaged, meaningfully engaged. As we know, we all have different passions and interests and it's important that we continue to be engaged in a way that's meaningful to us. And I've spoken about this before, the significant role that community and communities play uh, in creating healthy, inclusive and connected communities. You know, we've learned through some of our work that older Canadians call first responders just for a human voice at the other end of the line. We've learned through our work that about the large number of older Canadians that go malnourished because they don't want to eat alone. But we've also seen the vibrant ways that resilient communities have responded to keeping all citizens, regardless of ability and age, engaged in their communities. The community-based sector what we, is what we refer to the collective of community-based social and community agencies that provide hyper-local community-based programs and supports. And we found that this type of community-based programming is mutually beneficial, both for those that may be participating in programs, but those that are also leading and volunteering uh, uh, in, in community-based programs. In British Columbia, for example, we have uh, 
4,000 volunteers that support programs of which 2,900 are over the age of 65. And that shows to the level of engagement, wisdom, and contributions that all people of communities can make in supporting our neighbors. And there's thousands of community-based organizations across the province that do incredible work and offer really impactful programming, whether it's Tai Chi classes or walking clubs to intergenerational iPad learning to, to gardening and bees, bees clubs. We also know the incredible value of, of volunteering in the, so, in the nonprofit sector and how volunteering meaningfully has enhanced people's self-confidence, self-esteem, as well as the feeling of being able to contribute to one's own community. We've also seen leader, older Canadians emerge as leaders in their community to be able to provide consultation and feedback uh, around policies and programs, which are so important in order for us to be connected and meaningfully relevant in, our, in the delivery of our programs and services. It's important for us, we feel, and we've learned to address loneliness in a way that is culturally and socially sensitive, taking into account culture, language, historical life experiences, many of which um, have expressed, have experienced oppression, immigration patterns, those that live in different parts of the country, rural Canada, remote Canada. And we know that the incredible impact that these organizations across the country make are not well resourced, but it's the coming together that provides the collective advocacy for some of the work that we do. We know that the programs we do are aimed to cut across all levels of ability and mobility. You know, we've, we've had experiences when we've gone into remote villages to promote programming where we've learned that there's no Wi-Fi in the village. So we've had to go in and install Wi-Fi to help create those vital connections for those in the communities. I've had the privilege and honor of meeting a lot of older Canadians that live in rural Canada that are still farmers uh, and have been able to see their way of life and how based on their own desire, wish to continue to live their particular way of life and how community has responded to support older rural Canadians to continue to enjoy the life that they pre prefer to live. You know, there's sometimes a saying that people decide to, to live in risk. And I'm not sure that, um, I particularly agree with that. People decide to live in their home. People decide to live a life that they've been accustomed to living. And if, we, if we're not sensitive to these cultural and social nuances, I think we risk not addressing loneliness at a deeper level. And we know that loneliness can lead to physiological and cognitive declines, but it can also increase susceptibility to abuse, to neglect, uh, and self-worth. And we've seen some of this, uh, some of the work during the pandemic where over 10,000 volunteers came together to provide over 340,000 services in three months in BC to older people that live in their homes. And the stories that we hear about older people feeling like it's Christmas when, they've, when their friendly visitor checks in on them, or when we hear about older people actually calling their volunteer daily to check in on the volunteer, we see the mutual benefits of some of the work that happens, where we had three or four villages rally around a senior that needed food in a very remote community, and, act, and where we see volunteers coming to clear yards so that older Canadians can leave their homes is a way it's to, to go to get their flu shot is a way that we've seen communities come together to, to support their neighbors, regardless of age. You know, during the pandemic, we've all felt a level of perhaps isolation or loneliness, but I would maybe suggest that many of us would be able to call someone. If we were in an emergency, we'd be able to take the phone and call a family or friend, but that's not the case for a large number of people. When one in four Canadians in Metro Vancouver don't have someone to talk to, that's a problem. 
but it's, it's a problem that's in our sphere of influence to address. Showing your local love by giving your time, your talent is one incredibly impactful way to be able to support those in our own communities, many of which are neighbors that require a little bit more support. And so it's a bit of a call to action, but you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the thousands of volunteers and agencies across the country that have been able to pivot to continue to support the heightened levels and heightened experiences of loneliness uh, during this time. With that, Laura, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks so much, Kahir. And thank you for all of your work and your leadership and that of all of your members as well. I know you guys were working around the clock and a lot of the, your work that's doing is actually very much a kind of a basic level of Maslow's hierarchy. It is in fact about keeping people housed, about keeping people fed. And in my respectful view, you know, that loneliness is right there with uh, homelessness and hunger in terms of addressing our basic needs. Really appreciate the work that you're all doing. Excited to welcome to the stage our next speaker. And Alex, I'm gonna let you just uh, unmute yourself and come onto the stage. We know that you have been working a lot in the areas of inclusion, whether it be digital inclusion or other forms of inclusion. And the Toronto Public Library has been doing great work. We also look to the TPL as a bit of a model for other communities, understanding that you serve a wide variety of people with a wide ethnocultural base, lots of diversity in your work. So I'm going to toss it over to you. What do you think that we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive? Um, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate today. Um, Toronto Public Library has been providing dedicated and creative, I think, senior services for years now, and I've uh, only recently had the privilege of leading our Digital Literacy for Seniors initiative uh, and seniors outreach programming efforts. Um, so I'd like to answer this question by sharing some of how Toronto Public Library's programs and services have tried to address social inclusion uh, of seniors. So. Um, one of the ways is we've been trying to make our spaces, our physical library branches more age inclusive and age friendly in a number of ways. Uh, for example, we provide a broad range of programming, recognizing the broad range of uh, interests of seniors. Um, uh, on topics like music, health and wellness, financial literacy, uh, and information workshops on the law and available resources and public services. Um, and what we're trying to do is draw people into the library uh, on shared interests and appeal to those who come to the library uh, to use our, our collections uh, uh, to kind of expand their horizons. Um, we've also been collaborating with the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto to provide TPL, all TPL public service staff training, uh, mandatory training on dementia friendly communities, uh, which has been quite successful over the last few years. Um, the other big way I think that the library is supporting senior social isolate, uh, inclusion rather is through expanding our digital literacy programming for seniors. Um, so in general, I would say that providing digital literacy support is increasingly core to library service in the last couple of years. And that's the case uh, all across the country. And that's because of the different ways that people need to access information. Um, and um, so we really love uh, recommendation 119 uh, from the CanAge roadmap, which recommends that library schools and nonprofits uh, or com and community organizations work with stakeholders to support community-based in-person and remote digital literacy training for seniors and invest in uh, technology lending for seniors. Um, uh, which is, yeah, I think it's just, it's really great. Uh, so in the last few years, our older adult services committee uh, developed our digital life skills for seniors programming series, which is a low tech workshop um, uh, for seniors to introduce them how to access services through the internet to even introduce them to the kind of core concepts. Um, did you know you can shop online? Did you know that you can plan your travel online? Uh, did you know you can connect with people socially online? And this is how you can do it in a safe way, uh, which is an important aspect we've made sure to include in, in all of our training. Um, and then last year we piloted a dedicated hands-on seniors digital literacy program uh, with the dual goals of providing beginner level digital literacy training um, for seniors and decreasing social isolation. Um, so we piloted um, 
we we've targeted this program and uh, a number of newer programs that we're working on to low income seniors in particular. Um, Toronto's senior strategy identifies low income being a kind of common indicator, both of social isolation and low digital literacy levels in the city. You know, these things tend to intersect. Um, uh, so we piloted our program with 60 seniors in the library uh, and each library branch location was selected based on its proximity to low income seniors housing. Um, and we used a cohort model. We scheduled breaks, uh, snacks, and uh, plenty of time to practice, repeat those lessons and get them into, into uh, habit. Um, this was not just to support social connection, uh, but also because learning together as a peer group is one of the best ways to retain information, to keep it going and, and be motivated to learn. Um, so uh, it was important to us to implement this pilot um, with a thorough evaluation plan that measured both digital literacy skill improvement and social indicators, because we wanna take that evidence um, that we gather and use it to demonstrate impact and support our opportunities to grow. Um, so uh, I'll give you some examples of what we learned. Um, in our follow-up survey, our participants reported learning how to use a search engine, how to use the internet, how to email uh, friends and family. Uh, and 82% of respondents agreed that the program contributed to their sense of social belonging. Um, the model really prioritized reducing the stress and anxiety that seniors feel um, when they're learning new technologies. Um, and this can be a real, uh, a real detractor, something that stops seniors from, from really taking the time to, to figure out how to use these new tools to connect. Um, and uh, one comment from a participant uh, that I'm particularly proud of is uh, one senior who said, we're all in the same boat, so I did not feel uncomfortable asking a question. And that's like, that's what we're going for. Because um, you need to ask those questions and you need to feel safe to do that. Um, so of course, our chance uh, to expand the pilot was limited once COVID hit. InBridge programming is suspended until next year. Uh, but one of the first efforts the library made to support our seniors was to coordinate check-in calls for all library card holders over the age of 80. Uh, and so far in the last four months, we've reached 5,000 people. Um, our Wi-Fi hotspot lending program uh, distributes free home Wi-Fi equipment for six months. Um, participants are selected through the City of Toronto's Community Coordination Plan, which includes partnerships with organizations like Care for Seniors and others dedicated uh, seniors um, services. Um, and we're currently in the process of hiring seniors digital literacy interns. So these uh, six new staff members will be providing additional dedicated services for seniors uh, in Toronto community housing uh, and with seniors community centers across the city. So we are hoping they can do um, three things. Uh, we want them to be connecting seniors living in Toronto community housing buildings to online library programming delivered by the library. So um, uh, lots more online programming, but also um, having our interns connect by phone to help people to um, figure out how they can be connecting to our online programming and bridge that gap between, you know, maybe interest and um, uh, and actually the actual ability to participate. Uh, and we're also hoping to arrange um, in-person visits to seniors' homes, uh, locations, and um, community centers to provide in-person digital literacy training for seniors fully contingent on public health conditions and guidelines uh, but we are looking in to see what we can do to um to to bring that education right to their doors um so i think that's my time i'll just conclude by saying that our, our experience really shows uh that digital literacy training not only helps seniors to use new technologies to make connections but the process itself can reduce social isolation and contribute to a sense of social belonging. So I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. And the chat is exploding with interest in the work that you're doing as well. And uh, and you know we're going to put the information about that Wi-Fi lending program in our chat and make it available to you as well. Also, that uh, digital literacy internship program, six opportunities across the uh, the GTA, that's also an exciting one. We'll get that information to you as well. Terrific programming, and we're excited to see where this leads.
Well, we've been talking about digital literacy. Let's do just a bit of a deeper dive from the broader piece that we're talking about into an actual example of an innovative program, which is really helping social inclusion. Emily, I'm going to invite you to the stage and we're going to talk a little bit more about your great program, what you're seeing. And I'm going to ask you the big question. What do we need to do from your point of view to make Canada more age inclusive? Thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate you having me here today. Um, yeah, I think in terms of, of digital literacy, this this has definitely been an ongoing concern uh, for many, many years. And, and um, uh, my partner and I, who started Connected Canadians, we had been uh, volunteering in the community for almost 20 years before we ever started Connected Canadians as a nonprofit. Um, and um, we just recognized that while there were many organizations uh, serving youth, serving women, serving many other margin, uh, populations that needed uh, this kind of help, there were very few that seemed to be uh, specifically focused on seniors. And so um, in uh, just about almost three years ago now, we decided that uh, we really wanted to start a, a national nonprofit to help um, address this issue as it, as it was a very glaring one and um, on our own strength. Uh, we would not be able to, to do that. So um, we started off um, quite modestly. It was just us. And um, we realized um, very early on in that getting volunteers was very key. And um, uh, after initially experimenting on our own, um, we managed to, to acquire an enormous amount of, of fantastic volunteers. And we discovered that most of our volunteers um, were actually new immigrants to Canada who were highly skilled in technology and um, volunteering with us and, and our seniors um, gave them a chance also to reduce uh, social isolation and, and integrate um, into, into the Canadian population in a, in a more effective way as it, it gave them that opportunity to, to meet people of other generations and, and while exchanging um, you know, their knowledge, um, they, they could get to know some lovely people on their side as well. Um, and in terms of the Ottawa area, pre-COVID, um, we established partnerships with Ottawa Community Housing, uh, Briere Hospital, and the Pearly, Retro, uh, Pearly Rideau Veterans Hospital, um, where we were serving seniors pretty actively um, pre-COVID-19. Of course, um, after COVID-19 hit, uh, things, th things changed quite dramatically. Um, luckily, given our volunteer base, who were all um, mostly in high tech, um, we realized that, um, you know, serving seniors online was not that much of a stretch because we, we had those tools, we used them every day in our day jobs. And um, so training folks how to do that was, um, was not an issue. However, f figuring out how do we actually address this massive need um, was a bigger issue because our volunteers were all used to working evenings and weekends because they worked during the day um, at their software development jobs and, and so on. And so, um, we managed uh, to get a grant from the city of Ottawa to um, hire and retrain um, hospitality uh, mentors who actually had lost their jobs um, due to COVID-19, uh, working as uh, bartenders, uh, wait staff, et cetera, um, and to give them basically two weeks of technology training um, and um, train them so that they could, they could serve our isolated seniors online remotely with the tools that um, our existing technology volunteers used. Um, and this um, was actually a, a wonderful success because we, we ended up getting, uh, again, two populations who were dealing with a certain form of social isolation, um, working together and, and learning new skills together at the same time and um, being able to um, help each other in, in, in different ways. So um, that's been going amazingly well. Um, we are on our third cohort of, of hospitality mentors now who are still working with seniors and have been have been fully trained um, to work on our team and, and are paid to work during the day, which was a huge need since um, we, we really needed that extra staffing as it came in. Um, another thing that um, at, during COVID that was an, a massive issue was just the fact that we started to have all of these other senior serving organizations reaching out to us because um, my partner and I both having backgrounds in, in technology, my, my background was in computer science and my, my partner's background was in computer math and, and we'd worked in tech for many years. Um, we, we found that many other senior resource centers, um, all, all different kinds of um, organizations across the country really were struggling because they wanted to be able to help seniors um, in, in an in organized manner, but um, they didn't necessarily have the technical skills to do that. So um, we've been working as well to figure out ways to 
to pass on that knowledge. And um, we've got both the train the trainer program um, where we're helping to train our other organization staff and volunteers as technical mentors using the skills that we have. Um, and we're also um, working with, uh, with Help Age Canada uh, to roll out a, a device lending program where we pair, um, we pair seniors with a, with a device as well and data as well as a, a technical mentor who helps them learn how to use it. So this has been really life-changing because um, in the early days we found um, before we were working with Help Age, um, just the the amount of resources that went into this you you really needed um, to send somebody a, a data enabled uh, device because um, expecting folks many of the seniors that we were serving were so low income and and so um, far away from from what we understand is a modern grasp on technology um, they they wouldn't have the wi-fi or any of the infrastructure to set up so giving them that data enabled device um, was was huge and so um, now we're working with Help Age Canada to roll out a, a, a national program um, this month and um, that one hopefully will be able to help many more seniors. We're also um, working um, with the National Gallery right now to um, finalize an upcoming partnership as well to, to allow seniors to have um, virtual art experiences online, um, which, which we can as well use with our multiple other programs. Um, we uh, sorry. Um, we also have a social gaming program as well in place where we can set up groups of, of isolated seniors to play together and be able to see each other's faces and talk online um, and while playing a game together, which is which is a little bit different from our tech, typical technical mentorship because it's not just focused on the problem solving and learning aspect, but more focused on the social engagement. Um, and uh, we're actually building our own game as well because we realize that some of the existing technology that, out, that is out there is, is not quite sufficient um, in terms of uh, it, providing that full user experience for all ages. Um, so I think I'm getting to the end of my time here. I, I could talk a lot longer about all of the things that we're doing as there's a great deal of them, but um, please be sure to check out uh, connectedcanadians.ca as well as seniorscanconnect.ca to see some more information on that. Thanks so much, Emily. People are also exploding in the chat talking about it, learning more about the social gaming and also your web links are there. So thanks very much for your time today. And I am now going to invite to the stage Dr. Reza Mirza. Reza, a very, very dear friend of ours. You know, Reza, you've done a lot of work in this field, but one of the things that's a little bit different that you have as well is you've actually got some research around social inclusion. We actually know some things now about social inclusion, research, mild cognitive impairment, and so on. So just to add to the weight of the things I want you to talk about today, I wonder if you could tell us, you know, what have we learned, what do we know, and what we don't know um, as well. And uh, I'm turning it over to you now. What do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive? Well, thank you so much, Laura. Um, first, I'll start off by saying thanks so much for your leadership and for your incredible work on putting together voices. And of course, thanks to the amazing team at KNH, some of those uh, individuals who are on the webinar today. It, you know, it's been their tireless support, their commitment and dedication in helping bring the Voices Roadmap to life. And I'm, I'm happy to share some of the insights from uh, the research that we've done. But I have to say that it is indeed more important than ever to have a roadmap for an agency age inclusive Canada and that I appreciate the opportunity to speak today as part of this great panel and so in the earlier sort of introductions I just wanted to uh, repeat that I'm a researcher affiliated with the University of Toronto's Institute for Life Course and Aging and I'm, I'm here today in my capacity as the network manager for NICE. So in, in addressing this question about how we can make Canada a little bit more age inclusive I'd like to start off by suggesting that while the conversation will focus on social inclusion it's actually social exclusion that cuts older adults off from mainstream institutions and it limits really limits an older person's ability to participate in society in the ways that they would like. Now, social inclusion, in my opinion, is both a process and an outcome. And we've learned about a lot of these sort of procedural issues and you know the outcomes of social exclusion from our research. And so I would say that the foundation for improving the overall quality of life and well-being for older adults. And, and I'm talking about the factors associated with things that we, we're hearing about, digital, digital literacy programs, community programming, social inclusivity, and all these things cut across the social determinants of health. I think the best way to achieve these things are by building capacity amongst older adults themselves, 
so that we can allow older adults to become mainstream social citizens instead of being marginalized through what sometimes seems like separate health and social service systems. Now, in saying this, I know that the foundation is going to require new policy and practice responses, and that this is going to require well-funded research and evidence that captures the complex issues of both exclusion and inclusion that face an aging population. Just a little bit about our organization. NICE is a knowledge transfer network, and we aim to improve the care of older adults in Canada and abroad. We aim to accomplish this by placing valid and reliable knowledge on aging into the hands of those who need it. Now, this includes older adults, their family members, practitioners across disciplines, which include nursing, social work, law enforcement, and these are just some examples of these disciplines, students and policymakers. Now, our network is an important resource for many, as current professionals are not always up to date. We know that the knowledge base in gerontology and geriatrics remains fairly thin, and that attracting new students to the discipline can be a real challenge. And, and I hope to build on that in some of my later points as well. So as Laura mentioned, we've conducted extensive research regionally, nationally, internationally, and this has given us important insights and lessons that I hope to share with you today. And two of the things that I will talk about today are the Toronto Home Share Program and the Talk to Nice Program, and details of that will come a little bit later. But from our perspective, it's crucial that decisions are made with older adults and not for older adults, and that one of the ways to do this is to fund more gerontological research that partners in a meaningful way with older Canadians and to create new opportunities and pathways that'll help equip older adults with the resources and supports to lift themselves out of the exclusion that they may face. So I think this is an important point because if we look beyond the general experiences of older adults in our country and the average older Canadian, we get a better view of the most vulnerable populations who may face social exclusion and really may need our support. So our research is specifically focused on these populations and includes victims of elder abuse, older members of the Aboriginal community, those who are socially isolated, older immigrants in diverse communities, grandparents who are parenting again in later life, older adults who may not be financially literate, those who are living in poverty, which oftentimes are mainly older women, those vulnerable to late life, or what we now refer to as gray divorce, and those who are unable to access quality end of life care with respect to hospice and palliative care, because social inclusion is about the ability to access supports and resources, as, as Gregor mentioned. Um, and so even end of life is, is something that we need to consider as well. So older adults are active, active contributors to Canadian society. We can see that from some of the examples of, that have been raised about you know, the, the important volunteer roles that older adults place. But as Gregor stated earlier, they're often still portrayed as feeble, dependent, passive, and as such, they're, they're frequently marginalized and denied equal social citizenship with respect to opportunities for civic participation and engagement. Now, that being said, older adults are frequently subject to ageism. So we've heard this already in some of the comments from the other panelists. And I know this is a priority area for Can Ages Voices Roadmap, but ageism, as we know, is manifest in many subtle ways through discrimination in the workplace, through transportation issues, the denial of the right to quality care, supports in later life and end of life, and the opportunities for engagement, especially through housing and social services. Now, if older adults are not treated like all other citizens, they're often socially excluded within their own communities. That being said, we are firmly committed to the perspective that older adults are indeed adult citizens and have the right to be responsible for themselves. And we have to equip them with the resources and supports to, so they can achieve that sense of responsibility. Now, the research on the implications of differing rights and opportunities, I can get to that in more detail during the Q&A, but some of the research that I'll, I'll highlight here has shown that one in four older adults in Canada desires greater social involvement within their communities, and social inclusion was identified as one of the most important social determinants of well-being. And if we get into the conversation about cognitive decline, social isolation, depression, physical inactivity, all things that might be connected, also could lead to a risk factor for dementia. And through a new Lancet study, what we see is that um, there are up to 40% modifiable risk factors that can address things like cognitive decline. So I hope we get a chance to talk about that as well. But status inequality, social exclusion among older adults have been identified as both hidden problems and ones that are difficult to overcome. And so having the opportunity to expose these issues and raise awareness is really important. 
And as I mentioned, many older adults report having very few opportunities for civic participation, volunteerism, and participation in the paid economy. Now, I'll, I'll reference one of the studies that we conducted on social isolation. I know we've had a conversation both with Kahir and Gregor about social isolation and age-friendly communities and, and specifically about downtown Toronto. We found that 65% of the respondents reported earning an income of $20,000 or less as a family. So this is well, well below the low income cutoff for Canada at 24,000. Now, if we put the statistic within the context of housing for seniors, we can see how, in, how income can impact the quality of life and the factors which determine how engaged and how active an older adult can be in the community. As another example of a study that we've conducted, Grandparents raising grandchildren are disproportionately older women and often from the Aboriginal community. And older separated divorced women and immigrants face multiple layers of financial and social jeopardy as they grow older in Canada. Now, specifically talking about the Voices Roadmap, I'll talk about issues 35 to 40, which are very important focal points for social inclusion and are particularly important for the work that we're doing as well. Now, we created a community-based program in response to COVID-19 called Talk to Nice. The program connects older adults with trained social workers and social work students. This program has really opened our eyes to how weak some older adult social support networks are. They literally have no one to call, so they call our phone line. And also, how limited training opportunities are in gerontology and geriatrics for students. So even if students are interested, the opportunities are very limited. This leads to my next point, which is that Intergenerational programs, as outlined in Recommendation 133, allow us to consider our response to aging as twofold. So we need to address the needs of the current old and engage the younger generation, the future old, in very meaningful ways. The Toronto Home Share Program, which pairs older adults with post-secondary students, has highlighted the real benefits of intergenerational programming, well, but it has also shown us that there are limited platforms for generational enga engagement and exchange, and so we need to work on that as well. So I'll close by saying that NICE is committed to the development of evidence-based knowledge for better training of students in gerontology and geriatrics, but most critically, the straightforward treatment of older adults as an asset to society rather than a threat. And so I know this won't be an easy task, but we need to send a message that we include and count on older adults to be active citizens of our country and that we value them. So, okay, I'm done for now. And thank you. I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, everybody, and thank you, Raz. And it's great to know, you know, what do we know actually in evidence about social inclusion and social exclusion, as opposed to just kind of working with things that we might anecdotally know. So I really appreciate that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the home share program as well as what this point. I'm going to invite all of our panelists to come and take the stage so they get to unmute their video and join us all together at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Just give everyone a moment to roll in. Perfect. Thanks very much. And Brett is here, our host as well. All right. We've got some great questions already in our chat. Lots and lots of things going on as well. So Brett, I'm going to turn it over to you. What is our first question for our expert panel? Thanks, Laura. Uh, I've got a great question here from, ba uh, from Bonnie, and it actually comes in the chat. Uh, Bonnie says, so glad to hear that the Toronto Public Library has a seniors digital literacy program. Can it possibly be expanded to include people with low literacy and people with disabilities that aren't seniors? Yeah, so I'm going to head that over to you, Alex, but I know that some other people may want to pick up on that as well. So we'll just start with you. Thanks. Uh, that's a great question. Um, we definitely have we so we have an adult literacy service specialist at the library and we have uh, reviewed our documentation and our materials with that person um, and we do offer a, a regular series of low uh, adult literacy uh, training although the idea of um, incorporating that into our dedicated digital literacy programming is is uh, not something we've deeply explored so that's really great um, and then uh, I did really focus on our um, our seniors focused digital literacy, but we do offer um, we do offer digital literacy education to anybody who wants to attend. Um, in 2019, we offered um, over 1,200 classes over the system uh, for anybody who wants to attend, including um, 
uh, a number of classes uh, in languages other than English, depending on the, the neighborhood. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I, I know that as we're looking across these issues, we do have to make sure that, you know, we can help both the targeted groups and then also look who else can benefit from maybe a more modified version. I just wanted to let, you know, we let Kahir go. He had an urgent meeting that he had to pop to, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to share some information about their programs. And what I would also offer is, that the United Way has done some great work as well in funding and supporting programs. And Gregor, I know that you have as well. But Brett, we've got lots happening in our chat and Q&A today. Um, what's next on our questions for our expert panel? Thanks, Laura. Great questions today. Uh, I think this question will move to Sarah. Sarah says, in my urban neighborhood, those of us who are aged 40 to 50 take care of our older neighbors. This includes wellness checks, grass cutting, snow clearing, et cetera. Nobody under, under 40 seems to care. What would help to bring awareness to this demographic? All right, who wants to take that one? Ageism is not easy. Um, Gregor, do you want to take a little hit on it? And maybe I'll call upon Raza afterwards to, to say. So again, the question is like, how do we need to include people across the life course and being more age inclusive. And, and I know that in the time of COVID-19, there's both opportunities and challenges. Maybe speak a little bit to some of the work that you guys have been doing around getting communities across the age spectrum involved in help and support. Yeah, well, that, that's definitely a great question. And, um, uh, you know, there's one of the, uh, one on the roadmap, I believe it's uh, issue 40, uh, is is on intergenerationalism. And, uh, you know, I remember a friend of mine who came from Nigeria and he was perplexed because he saw the whole community together on Sundays at church, but became painfully aware that the, 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 the rocks of his community around which in his culture, the community revolved were, were absent the rest of the time. And so not only can we ask how to keep older people at, at, you know, at home and engaged, but how can we engage more fully with them throughout our lives? How can we connect them with younger people, with children, sharing in arts, music, nature, games, meals, and in the way we design our, our cities, our recreation, and our, and our shopping facilities? So I think that the question is not a, a um, you know, there may be some, some, some opportunities for things we can do at a community level, but it's also about raising our awareness and including older people in our activities, in our family life, um, more regularly in our meals and so on. Help Age Canada uh, has done an extensive amount of work in Nunavut and in the north. And one of the greatest joys is gathering with a, uh, in Nunavut with Inuit people for a games night and experiencing the whole community together. It's just absolutely a riot. So from a, from a larger perspective, I would say we need to be paying attention to how we just generally include older people in our lives uh, uh, moving forward. When it comes down to a local community and, and people you know, observing that, that maybe younger people aren't paying attention so much to older people, I think you know, it's opportunity for relationship building and inviting them to participate and getting to know older people in their communities so that the, the natural inclination, they may be moved to participate more fully. Uh, Help Age Canada, we, in, we engage in micro grants, uh, providing opportunities for older people, uh, low income people to, to access their communities more, whether that's through mobility equipment or communications devices, programming and so on. But as an attempt to knit older people who, because of many of our structures, end up being isolated, bringing them more together to participate more fully in community. It's, it's a great community and it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint of how we can, through relationship, knit ourselves together. So great question. And I'm going to build on that one to Raza. This is a great opportunity. I'd really like you to talk a little bit of our home share program. Sure. I know that the Toronto home share or the home share broadly, it's not just a Toronto program, although it was piloted out of Toronto. Um, I know that it's being looked at replicated across the country and it's intergenerationalism in action. Maybe you could just speak a little bit about that. Sure, I'll talk a little bit just generally about intergenerational engagement in the first place. And I think that we have to see intergenerational engagement in the, in the context of solidarity, because in the media and in other places, we see intergenerationalism as, as based around conflict. And it's, it's usually set up around the young and the old 
And I think to the example that was given about people in the community who are helping each other with, you know, household tasks like cutting the lawn and shoveling the snow, I think that suggests that there's an opportunity for exchange there. So I think we need to change the narrative that older adults are needy and feeble as I mentioned and Gregor mentioned and Kahir mentioned, but that there's a real um, opportunity for exchange between generations and we have to create platforms for that to be possible. And I think the other piece to keep in mind is that if we think about the life course perspective and the way that we sort of age grade society that older adults are supposed to be in certain places and spaces and younger adults are supposed to be in certain places and spaces. And so even this idea about age friendly, in, in, in some ways, the, the age friendly notion suggests that, well, we've been age unfriendly in many ways and retroactively we have to go back and look at our cities and designs and communities and programs to be age friendly. And so going forward, I think that if we are more age friendly and we think of communities as lifetime communities, you'll see a lot more interaction between generations and it won't be this sort of process where it doesn't feel organic. Even this idea about intergenerational engagement, it seems sort of forced sometimes where we have to put generations together because well, they don't usually interact with one another. Now the Toronto Home Share Program is an example and I can tell you that um, you know, the headlines around housing sometimes suggest that millennials can't get into the housing market because these older adults are clinging on to their homes. And again, it sets up the young versus the old argument. But uh, what we did find out is that when generations do engage with one, of, one another, and there is an opportunity for engagement, and so the Toronto Home Share Program, which I mentioned, matches students with older adults, there are great benefits to both the older adult and to the student and for the community at large. And so I think that, you know, it's about framing the narrative and moving away from some of the ageist stereotypes that we have. Fantastic. Thanks so much. It's a really inspiring program. I know that it's one that is really building bridges in community. And I'm seeing in our chat again, discussions about how do we get people younger and older working together, that intergenerational piece is not always so easy, especially in the time of COVID-19. I haven't seen my parents uh, and I've wanted to, believe me, I haven't seen them since February because they're healthy and well and in their eighties. And I wanna keep them healthy and well. And so it has been a real challenge opportunities as well in terms of digital literacy and so on, but there's new things that we have to look at. Brett, we've got lots of questions here going on and I wanna I want to get to as many of them as possible. What's our next question for our expert panel? We sure do. It's been a really active chat today. So our next question, Laura, comes from Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa says, I'd love to hear about fighting loneliness and social isolation for people living with dementia or mild cognitive impairment. What are the major challenges and do we have some success stories? Yeah, I'm gonna ask everyone in turn, maybe just kind of give a real short answer because this is one that, you know, in the way of all of these things, we're all working to support people where they're at and mild cognitive impairment is often showing up about 10 years before a formal dementia diagnosis. And, and so we wanna make sure that we build up people's capacities and so on. So I'm gonna ask each one of you in turn for just a few of your thoughts about how do we support people with mild cognitive impairment being included? Gregor, if it's okay, I'm gonna to turn to you and Alex, I'm gonna to come to you after Gregor. So mild cognitive impairment, confusion, supports dementia. How do we make sure that we have initiatives that include people who may have some challenges? Well, I, I think, you know, really that speaks to a, a national Canadian strategy and the investment in, as uh, Raza was, was, was speaking about, uh, the whole sector and developing skilled professionals and investing in the center to train people that have the capacity and soft skill development to, to, to to, uh, to care for and communicate with people with, with, with slight or even excessive co cognitive impairment. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a skill that needs that you, you work at. If you've, a lot of volunteers develop those skills over a long period of time, but I think we need to be able to develop a, a, a workforce that is properly uh, uh, paid and skilled and you know, trained to be able to, um, to uh, provide those kinds of services in, in a variety of mediums. 
Yeah, we do. We absolutely need to build that workforce. There's no question. Alex, over to you. I know that you know your library system has really been at the forefront of age-friendly libraries and also working to support some dementia inclusion. You even had a program, I think, with a social worker who was involved. Maybe you could just speak a little bit to some initiatives that you guys are having um, to address a more dementia-inclusive environment and help reduce that social exclusion of people who have some cognitive impairment. Sure. Uh, so uh, a lot of our work uh, has come from our collaboration with the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. So I definitely want to give them some recognition. Um, we've done a couple things. Uh, I mentioned before that we've done, uh, we've made mandatory training on dementia friendly communities for all of our public service staff. So that means that um, we've been working for the last two years to make sure that our staff um, in all of our branches, recognizing the signs and symptoms of dementia and understand uh, what kind of impact it can have on people's abilities to communicate, uh, make judgments. Uh, our staff are trained to um, develop communication strategies for helping people to navigate space. Um, and, uh, and also are trained to think about just broadly uh, the experience of dementia uh, when they are doing their own localized service development. Uh, so that is something we're trying to in include in just the baseline of, of service training for all staff. Um, we've also done um, some, um, well, there's another program that I, I particularly like um, is uh, led by Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, but it's a music project uh, that has uh, dedicated uh, personalized music listening um, mp3s um, given uh, given to uh, seniors with dementia and what we've done is we've provided a space for um, for those one-on-one -on -one interactions of the Alzheimer's Society of uh, Toronto um, folks to come in and meet with people in our spaces safe spaces spaces that are closer to their homes uh, easier for them to access and and so they meet in our spaces to come up with those one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, music playlists and it's just the fact of our public space saying like this is the place you can come this is a safe space and, and it's much closer to people than the three um, AST offices in Toronto um, and then we do have a we do have a social worker in uh, on employee who is working on a larger services to vulnerable populations program um, uh, for all staff that helps us to um, define terms like vulnerability and develop a training strategy for staff and, and services. Our focus primarily is on uh, people who are experiencing homelessness, uh, oftentimes, which uh, includes different mental health indicators. Um, and so we're working on a longer term strategy on how to make our spaces safe for people in, in those circumstances. That's great, Alex. And I know that, you know, we're all watching that program really carefully. The uh, the social worker in space program, particularly ones who may have expertise in aging and gerontology, I think are going to be a critical cornerstone of your Toronto Public Library system. But also, I think as we're seeing dementia friendly libraries and age friendly libraries roll out, we know that those inclusive spaces make all the difference, particularly since when we're thinking about memory preservation, things like reading, things like going to the library and so on are really hardwired for many people. It's a great mm -hmm. thing to, uh, to have that engagement. And I'm so pleased to see what you're doing. I'm going to turn it now to Raza as well. Raza, you've done a lot of work on cognitive impairment, dementia, mild cognitive impairment, and inclusion. You know, what do we know? What are some good initiatives and what are some things that we should not do? Because sometimes we talk about things that are good to do, but sometimes it's good to call out like what doesn't work as well. Well, I'll go back to the modifiable risk factor. So what we know now from research is that up to 40% of risk associated with cognitive impairment can, can be addressed by, by, by getting things like a hearing aid. So hearing loss itself, for example, is, is something that triggers people to start to disengage from their community, from their social circles, et cetera. But again, it goes back to ageism. People don't want to wear a hearing aid because it makes them look older and feel older. And so that leads to a sort of a spiral effect. And now that's just, again, a point that I'm trying to make, and I made it earlier, that there are modifiable risk factors, for example, hearing loss, 8% of your risk is tied to that. Social isolation, 2% of that is tied to, you know, you being engaged in your community. Depression, physical activity. So up to about 18% of your risk associated with cognitive impairment is something that you can modify. And so I think inclusive communities can help to address 
those sorts of risks. But I think another important point that I'll make is that, and I know you guys talked about this in your previous webinars, is that we need to get the evidence and the resources into the hands of older adults to understand the trajectory of dementia, understand what can be done. For example, exercise programs have been really beneficial in supporting older adults to maintain their cognitive health. And then the other piece that's important is about caregivers, getting the resources and supports to caregivers so that they can help support the older adult to stay in their home and community for as long as possible. And then the final point that I'll make is that programs, again, like the Talk to Nice program and the Home Share program have allowed people to stay in their homes by, for example, having a student in the home that can allow an older adult to have an activity partner with someone who can walk the dog for this individual because walking the dog is the difference that that makes between the person staying in their home and having to go to residential care or institutional care. So these are some of the points that I'll, I'd like to raise about that. Yeah, those intergenerational pieces we also know are protective. But one of the things I put in the chat, just to, I don't think people really realize, 80%, up to 80% of the risk for dementia are modifiable. What that means is we can actually help to preserve our own well-being by changing some aspects of what, what we're doing. Hearing loss is one of those areas. The way I got my father to get a hearing in the end was I was reading a bunch of peer-reviewed articles, which I knew he'd be interested in looking at because he's that kind of guy. And he saw it. I said, oh yes, here it is. And he looked at it and he saw that the link between hearing loss and dementia was real. And don't you know, after some years of trying to get him to get his hearing tested, he got a hearing aid. So it's important that we can actually make improvements. Emily, you're working with folks on a constant basis to be in age inclusive. You've got intergenerationalism built right in and you've got often folks who are coming maybe as newcomers to Canada or coming into the workforce again. So you've got all these things great again. Oh, sorry, 40% of your risk. I got overly excited. 40% of your risk is modified. I want it to be 80. Let's make it 40. Um, Emily, so how are you thinking about training staff or servicing people uh, to become more able in technology if they may have some form of mild cognitive impairment? So I would like to um, adjust that a little tiny bit just because um, we are certain we are working with the Dementia Society of Ottawa Renfrew at, at the moment and, and there's actually a few other um, Alzheimer's societies that have reached out to us as well. Um, but um, the main function that we're providing right now is 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 working to support uh, their caregivers. So um, they have found that they've they've rolled out a tremendous amount of, of uh, help um, online for caregivers that uh, the caregivers themselves may not be able to access. And so by working with our technology mentors, we're able to help provide that support to the caregivers, which um, is our plan in the next um, few months. And, and it's, a, it's something that we're working on right now. We need to get a bit more funding to, to make it uh, work. But um, it's certainly one, one way that we can help. Um, music is another one that we would really love to explore together. I, I, I myself would be very interested in that. Um, but um, I, it, we've spoken about the, the iPod program as well, like the one that, that Alex mentioned and, and seeing if we can find something um, similar to that that would also take advantage of perhaps streaming and, and other things provided that um, folks have the infrastructure in place to access those types of resources, which is an ongoing concern. Thanks so much, Emily. Okay, I just, I want to get to these questions because they're fantastic. Okay, one more question, Brett, what do we got? Thanks, Laura. Uh, it's tough to choose between all these great questions, but uh, we're going to go to my moo, and my apologies if I mispronounce your name. Uh, she asked comments by panelists um, about uh, how poorly kind of mainstream technology interfaces are designed by major companies um, and how this is a barrier for older adults with sight, hearing, or other challenges. Um, is there any kind of initiatives that uh, anyone in the group has been taking on to demand uh, changes in this area? 
can I start first? Because actually the answer is yes. And can age is one of those, but also I'll, I'll share this with my other colleagues, Emily, you know, I'm going to come to you in just a minute for that. So you're on the, you're on deck for that. Um, I, I wanted to share with you that our partners at AgeWell. So AgeWell is a net network of centers of excellence, and you can see the links in our, our chat and so on. AgeWell has been really doing a fantastic job helping to support integrative design. And they have actually got a chief entrepreneur who's a volunteer who also happens to be my husband. So Michael Tamblin is the CEO of Kobo, Canada's um, e-reading, which is also global. And I can share with you that he has uh, spoken about how Kobo and Rakuten, which is the large parent company, has been working with older people and people with cognitive impairment and people with tremors in long-term care homes, in focus groups with people who otherwise wouldn't actually be able to do it. And they've been integrating their a product development team in real time with people who have different tremor challenges or dry hands or shaking and, and so on. And so it's been a really interesting experience from a production point of view. I can brag a little bit, but AgeWell more broadly has been working to support the sector in its development. Emily, I know that one of the issues that you and I have talked about before is the fact that, you know, technology is not necessarily designed to be age inclusive. And I wondered if you could just share a few of your thoughts about that today. For sure. Um, I know um, with our mentors, especially we, we've we paired, um, you know, a lot of our mentors with different seniors who have all different kinds of accessibility challenges. And that has been a, a fascinating learning experience. And also because we we collect feedback after all of our sessions, um, it's, it's very useful. We can learn a lot from the types of interactions that these folks have. Um, with me and my partner both have backgrounds in, in technology and we, we used to participate in usability studies and things like that. So um, as as we collect all of this information, we always think um, it would be fantastic if we had the resources to actually be able to do a larger study on this because um, it's it's extremely uh, enlightening just to figure out all of the challenges that that happen and and um, even as our we have sponsors, for example, Lyft sponsored us last year and and. Um, so we were helping some of our seniors learn how to use the Lyft application on their phones to have free rides and things like that those who wanted them and through that process, um, while for many of them it worked quite well, um, we found, um, you know, on some of the older phones and, and some of the folks who had tremors and, and um, other sorts of accessibility challenges, there were certainly a lot of barriers in terms of them having a, a fully um, delightful user experience. And so um, I would say like, every session that we have now that they're remote it's the same thing um we we're collecting that kind of information all the time we just have to we have to have the resources to process it That's great. Thank you so much for your leadership in that area. And I know that there's lots. Again, go to our friends at AgeWell, one of our sponsors and co-hosts, and learn more. And if you are involved in an organization or a company that wants to be able to connect with AgeWell, do please reach out either to them directly or we're happy to connect you as well. Brett, I, I want to finish with one more question. What do you got for us? Sure. Uh, I think I have a pretty general question that we can really end with. Um, and so this question comes from Peter, and Peter's really wants to know, is there a resource or a dictionary available that kind of features language that is not ageist? Ah, okay. And actually, maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to build that a little bit bigger as well, because I saw a few other questions about ageism in our chat box and in our questions. So the last question I'm going to ask each of you for about 30 seconds, if you could wave a magic wand and you could do something to fight ageism. We've seen questions about campaigns in our chat box. We've seen, you know, issues with regards to language and so on. If you could have 30 seconds each or one thing that you could do to reduce ageism, what is it that you would do? And I'm going to start with Gregor and then go to Raza. Gregor, if you could wave your magic wand to reduce ageism, what would you do? Well, that's a, boy, that's a, that's a big question. If I was to wave my, my, my magic wand, it would be about educating the public, educating the Canadian public and um, bringing awareness to the, 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 the sacredness of, of, of life at, at, at every stage. 
So older people needing to be uh, full participants and in inclusive in Canadian society as, as leaders, as people with voice, as actors, um, uh, and providing the means and the, whether that's digital literacy or accessibility, uh, to have voice and participate fully in society, bringing our, our whole collective community to value uh, older people as, as full participants in our family, community, and civic life. That's a lovely way to sum it up. Thank you. Raza to you, ageism is something you're fighting against. I know that you led mm -hmm. a campaign, an anti-ageism campaign. Well, we have an anti-ageism in the workplace campaign. You can learn more about it at agingcream.ca, where we ask people to try on a cream that would make them look older. And the obvious answer was, well, I don't want to look older. So if I could wave my magic wand, here it is. I would go back and I would reverse this idea that retirement happens at the age of 65, because I think that has been a very big problem, because people start to continue to see old age of starting at the age of 65 and that stays to be sort of like a barometer and a goalpost and divides the young and old and there's expectations around that that people will retire move out of their homes they should no longer work in academia and other settings as well so i, I think that's what i would do fabulous thank you i'm going to go to alex next wave your magic wand what would you do i would um so i have this is really emerging from this conversation uh the kind of clarity of this so i thank everybody for, for who's brought it up but i think i would want make to make accessible design just absolutely mainstream for all service and technology basically so that there's not two lanes uh of service two lanes of technology you know this is for young people this is for older people uh, if we're just designing things from the start in public spaces in, in technologies uh in government services, like everywhere you look, if we're just assigning or we're just assuming we're designing for people with low hearing, uh, low vision, um, uh, who who are, have low digital literacy, then I, I think that would make a you know a massive difference. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you so much. And Emily, last word to you. Wave your magic wand. Yeah, what sure. do you got for us? <laughs> my my magic wand is a, is a marker, but um, I would actually uh, tackle the beauty industry because one of our partnerships um, last year we had a program with uh, Sephora, and that was very enlightening. Um, we we would end up bringing um, uh, older ladies into Sephora to uh, have makeup done and, and digital makeovers that they'd learn how to use on their own devices. And uh, through that whole experience, there was there was both the accessibility features, which Alex referred to, which I also would wish, uh, but there was also also just the overall um you know focus on being youthful which which i found you know it was it was almost hilarious to have that you know youth forever and and we're like applying you know this awesome makeover to this 80 year old and it's like she doesn't want to be young forever she's good so like just being able to say um you know it's it's fine like beauty is beauty where however old you are and and um allow folks to to embrace that image and and uh, yeah Wonderful. Thank you. I love these. The last is we're going to go to a poll now. We're going to hear from you. So our team member, Christiane, will get our poll ready and get ready to vote. We've got a couple questions. You can jump right in. I'll read them, but feel free to jump in. So number one is what kind of programs would you most like to see in your community? Volunteering, intergenerational programs, library and technology programs, fitness and sports, social, or all of the above? So that's question number one. Question number two is, have you or someone you know ever experienced age discrimination? And question number three is, do you believe that words like elderly are ageist? So again, question number one, what kind of programs would you most like to see in your community? Volunteering, intergenerational, library and technology, fitness and sports, social, or all of the above? Second question is, have you or someone you know ever experienced a form of age discrimination? And the third question is, do you believe that words like elderly are ageist? We're getting all kinds of things rolling in right now. We're just going to give them a minute or two as well. Emily, I loved hearing about that last comment from the woman who's 80. No, no, she's good. She's fine. Beautiful is beautiful. I don't need to look, uh, I don't need to look older. Although interestingly, um, you know, Raza, as we're just waiting for our poll to finish, I really encourage you to have a look for folks 
um, at the agingcream.ca website. It got a lot of media and press too. This, uh, this horror of people from all ages saying, well, why would I want to look older? And Emily, I'll just share with you that we had one guy who must have been in his late 80s, 90s, and he was just terrified at the idea of looking older. All right, then. I am going to end the poll and share the results with you here. So we have an all of the above. 76% said that they would like all of these kinds of programs with 14% saying they wanted us to focus on intergenerational, 8% on library, and also 3% on social. So really an all of the above one. Have you or anyone you know ever experienced a discrimination? 89% said yes, they had. 11% said no. And then a really interesting mix. Do you believe that words like elderly are ageist? And there's always such an interesting discussion about words and language and so on. And I do think that, you know, it is interesting. So in this case, we had 65% of our participants who said yes, and 35% said no. Language is one of those areas that also is culturally interesting and appropriate, and we need to meet people where we're at with that. So thank you for that. We've had a wonderful time today, and I'm just going to share a few quick wrap-ups, and uh, I'm going to take your last seconds away. Here we go. And so we are hoping that you will be able to share this recording at our canage.ca slash webinars and also on our YouTube channel. We got lots of it going on. And again, don't forget the age inclusive roadmap that folks were talking about today. You can download it for free at canage.ca slash voices, or you can work out it interactively. It opens and expands for you on our website. I also want to take a special thank you to our friends at Help Age Canada who are out there every day supporting and raising funds in philanthropy for older people and intergenerational programs. So if you're interested, please pop over to our friends at helpage.ca and maybe uh, you can think about how to donate or encourage someone you know to donate. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to raise your voice up as advocates for an age inclusive society, but we can't do that unless you write to us first. Those are the privacy laws. So please get a free membership. We won't bombard you with a lot of things, I promise, but you will get our age uh, newsletter and you'll get some access to podcasts and other great things as well. Canage.ca slash join. Again, it's free. Please uh, write to us. And so we can write back to you. Here are the resources. Again, these are going to be shared with you. Don't worry about writing them all down right now, but all of the organizations that we've profiled today are here on our slides. At any time, reach out to us at info at canage.ca. If you have questions or concerns, feel free. If we didn't get to your question, don't worry. We'll be answering them all offline and sharing the answers with you. So no question will remain unanswered. Uh, we can also be easily reached on our social media and we're actively uh, engaged in social media platforms. We know that you are as well. Please feel free to reach out. So what can you do? Our website, our newsletter, Follow us on social media. We'll follow you right back. Don't worry about that and join our free membership program. This concludes our four day free conference, which is made possible by our sponsors and our co-hosts. Each of you, I'm gonna ask you that you consider unmuting your microphone to our panelists and join us in waving goodbye to our participants today. From me here and all of our team at CanAge, thank you very much. Bye everyone. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone, and have a terrific day.